Hello, I'm Fred Hayes. I was the uh, lunar module pilot on Apollo 13, and I also had the pleasure of flying Enterprise of five of the eight test flights we did in the approach and landing test. Well, I, I grew up in a very small town, uh, Biloxi, Mississippi. Uh, it was predominantly a fishing village and had a small uh, bit of tourist business. It had a, a couple of beaches, but very small beaches. And in fact, today it's interesting, if you went to the uh, Mississippi coast, you'd find uh, the white beaches uh, span the whole coastal area, which was really made artificially later through dredging the uh, intercoastal canal. But at any rate, at, uh, activities, obviously, with the water there, uh, my other than school, my activities were a lot around the water, either fishing, uh, or even sometimes going out at night, uh, floundering and soft shelling. I did a lot of swimming. In fact, at one time I had a goal to swim to Ship Island, which was 12 miles uh, out. And I went to training and uh, I swam four miles, uh, four to five miles twice a day, uh, getting ready to do that. I never, never did get to do it, though. But it was that kind of uh, outdoor uh, activity. We had uh, uh, no city parks. Uh, so you used your schoolyard in those days. That was the uh, park, and we normally uh, stayed after school to dust sometimes, uh, playing uh, various games. Uh, so in a way, it was much simpler. There was not much electronics. Uh, you listened to the radio, because there was no TV uh, as I was growing up. And uh, during the war years, uh, it grew tremendously with the uh, Keesler Air Force Base in the Gulfport field, uh, where all at once we had 100,000 airmen on this town of 14,000 population, uh, inundated with uh, people in khaki I saw everywhere. But that, uh, that, that grew up the town to uh, where it is today, it's uh, around uh, 60,000. Uh, activities otherwise, as I got older, I went into the uh, Boy Scout program and had fun doing uh, camperies, in summer camps and some activity uh, earning uh, merit badges. Uh, I did not make uh, Eagle as some of my compatriots have. Uh, I got to a star rank. And unfortunately, uh, by then I uh, found out about girls and that ended my uh, Boy Scout career. Now, as far as what triggered uh, my getting into uh, the aerospace business in general, uh, I had not intended that I was going to be a journalist. I was interested in uh, that through high school, working on a newspaper, and went off to college for two years uh, with that as a major. Uh, then I signed up uh, in the military uh, to serve my country in the Korean War, and the program I went into was a Naval Aviation Cadet program, and I became a Marine pilot, uh, flew, flew in two different Marine fighter squadrons, and I uh, loved flying, so that uh, completely uh, changed my career path and I uh, wanted to be a, really a test pilot. Uh, that required an engineering degree, so I went back to school uh, with a different major uh, to get a degree in aeronautical engineering and joined NASA straight away in 1959 as a research pilot at Lewis Research Center, now called Glenn Research Center in Cleveland, Ohio. And after three and a half years there, uh, one of the programs, interestingly, was the second zero-G program in this country. Uh, the Air Force had the first zero-G program at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, where they were doing physiological tests with people. Uh, we were testing systems for spacecraft, uh, Centaur rocket. Uh, we evolved the screen system for the propellant tanks, uh, the cooling cycle. Uh, system for the SNAP-8 nuclear power generator that flew in the space flights. And uh, then I went off to Edwards Air Force Base to the NASA facility there, Flight Research Center, later becoming Dryden Flight Research Center. And again, was there uh, almost four years before applying and being accepted into the astronaut program uh, to complete a really, uh, when I retired from NASA in 79, a 20 year uh, NASA career. Uh, no, the crew never uh, discussed uh, anything other than what we had at hand to deal with. Uh, the, way, the way it went was right after the explosion, of course, there was quite a bit of confusion. 
Uh, we didn't help things. Uh, we, we were very poor in communicating uh, immediately to uh, Mission Control what we saw out the windows. Outside uh, was a large sea of debris uh, around the spacecraft. Uh, as I looked out, I could see look, what looked nearby, uh, little kernels of uh, frozen material that looked very much like popcorn. And as it went away, it was sparkly, a lot of sparkly things around us. And some shards of the uh, <coughs> gold and silver uh, thermal blankets. And we failed to report that until Jim later noticed, uh, probably about uh, 15 minutes, a sheen going away from the spacecraft to report that. But we got very busy then uh, with mission control into troubleshooting because we knew very clearly we'd lost one oxygen tank but there was hope of trying to save the second tank, the, the leak that was uh, evident uh, very slowly, but how to isolate the leak. So we went through a, a number of uh, troubleshooting steps that Mission Control directed to try to save that tank. Uh, it became apparent uh, that we weren't gonna be able to do that at a point. Jim asked me to go power up the uh, lunar module, start that process, uh, which shortly thereafter, uh, Mission Control came to the same conclusion and they asked Jim to, to join me in activating, starting to activate the lunar module to provide communication and life support uh, while we continued to work, work out the situation. Uh, I, I, uh, we never discussed uh, personally among ourselves uh, uh, the situation, except obviously we're all feeling, I'm frankly, a deep disappointment uh, rather than fear that we weren't getting back, uh, disappointment that we weren't getting the land. Uh, we've done a lot of work. I worked through two backup crew assignments before Apollo 13 and had done this training, uh, prepared for this mission, and now it, uh, it was gone. Uh, I had no plans for first words uh, if, if, as we landed. Uh, when I got a new map, I don't know if Jim did or not. Uh, he may have. Uh, I just planned to uh, get out and go to work. Uh, we had a, we had a, a very busy uh, timeline. Uh, we, uh, we were the first crew that really had the time because of the stretched uh, launch schedules to do quite a bit of geology training. And so we were uh, really the first crew that was going to do, I call it a full-blown uh, field geology exercise. And both uh, EVAs had very tight uh, timelines to get all we had laid out to get done. So I was just anxious to, uh, would have been anxious to get out and uh, get started to work. Uh, there was a redesign uh, uh, activity, obviously. Uh, when, you, when you have an accident, uh, there's normally a very thorough investigation. In this case, a board was, had been created, an accident board. And out of their findings uh, are generated the thoughts about uh, preventative measures. Uh, what was done specifically with the Apollo 14 uh, command, command service module was they added a limb decent battery uh, on, the, uh, on the one other side of one of the bays in the service module. And they also added uh, extra cryogenic tank, uh, also separated from the other two in a bay in the service module, so it had in essence a, uh, a backup uh, oxygen tank that was uh, separated from the other two. That, that is fairly conventional in uh, military aircraft where you separate systems on uh, either side of the uh, structure, for instance hydraulic lines, uh, electric, critical electric paths, uh, the wiring is on uh, uh, not adjacent to each other but rather separated uh, within the vehicle because you worry about battle damage. Uh, if you get, uh, when you get shot at, uh, you worry about uh, the uh, inflicting a wound in one, one area of the aircraft. You would still have this other path. No, we, we had not gotten very far uh, into, into the Apollo 16 training, actually as a backup uh, with uh, Jerry Carr and Bill Pogue. Probably about the four, four or five months into that training cycle when they canceled 18 and 19. So we, uh, we never got, <clears throat> we probably would not have gotten to that 
uh, concern about what to name our lunar module or spacecraft or patches till really we were officially uh, assigned and online working uh, toward our uh, Apollo 19 mission. No, no, I did not. I, I guess because uh, one thing I studied uh, in high school, quite a bit of astronomy, and uh, really going to the moon is not going very far. If you understand the uh, scope and size of the universe, <clears throat> to me the uh, flights, be there just like aircraft flights, it was a great adventure. Uh, it, was, it was not really a uh, religious uh, uh, Saga. It was, uh, like I said, just a great, a great adventure, and uh, and, and it had, had a lot of excitement, obviously. Uh, first, I was a test pilot, a research pilot for NASA at uh, Dryden Flight Research Center, then Flight Research Center. And I actively participated in uh, some of the analog simulations we did, <clears throat> looking at various configurations of lifting bodies. Uh, there had been a number that uh, evolved through wind tunnel tests at NASA Langley uh, in Virginia and at NASA Ames in uh, California. Uh, so we, I don't know, we probably looked at uh, several dozen uh, configurations to kind of narrow down to the uh, M2 and the uh, HL-10 uh, class vehicles. From there, I went into a uh, program. Uh, I was the primary pilot on the CalSpan uh, Variable Stability T-33, where we configured uh, that aircraft, which had big speed brakes to come out of the wingtip tanks uh, to simulate the drag, the equivalent drag, and fly the profiles uh, at Edwards of the uh, final types we, uh, we, can, we picked. Uh, namely, the uh, first one was going to be the M2, uh, F1, and F2. I flew uh, support roles mainly early on for the first lightweight lifting body we built, uh, the M2 F1, which was towed aloft by a, uh, R, R, uh, a Goody Bird, a C-47. Most people would think of it as a DC-3. But we could get it up on a 1,000-foot on a uh, tow rope to about 10,000 feet. And there, Milt Thompson was the first one to fly it where he uh, released uh, and landed on the uh, dry lake bed in Edwards. It had some solid rocket uh, 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 rockets uh, in the tail end that could give you a little extra time in landing. If you had trouble uh, and needed more time to get it on the ground, you could fire the rockets, which would buy a little coast time. Uh, those were only fired once by milk, just as a test, really. It was never, ever needed uh, for actual uh, landings. Uh, I did get to fly some of the ground toes, where we uh, had a souped-up uh, Pontiac convertible with a radio, and uh, the early flight control system was being uh, fine-tuned, the mechanical system we had in the first vehicle, uh, by towing across the lake bed, where we could get up to about 120, 130 miles an hour. And on, again, on the tow rope, you could get up a couple of hundred feet in the air uh, to feel out the uh, control authority and control field. And uh, we had adjustments in the linkages that you could land, and the linkages could be uh, adjusted uh, right out on the lake bed by a crew chief that rode along in the car uh, to slowly uh, work the control system to what we uh, knew would be good for flight. So I flew a, flew a number of those, if you want to call it flying, on the end of this uh, rope. Uh, but about that time, I, uh, I left, because uh, I applied and was accepted into the astronaut program uh, to uh, move to Johnson Space Center. So I really never uh, got to fly in the uh, actual lifting body program, the heavyweight. Enterprise was a, uh, was, was, was a nice uh, small program within the bigger program, like a flight actually back to like an aircraft test program. Our test director was Deke Slayton. Uh, Tom McElmurray, another uh, veteran in uh, flight test, was his uh, deputy. Uh, we had a great team, uh, 
from Kennedy that was there, uh, many who came later became launch directors like Bob Seek uh, was out for the program and we had a small nucleus out of the Rockwell uh, 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 group uh, that had actually uh, built and tested the Enterprise to uh, get it ready to fly. Uh, the, the, as far as the concern of uh, hitting the 747, we felt very safe. We had flown three flights where we did not release and the, the purpose of those flights were to get measurements of load cells that were in the three attach points, the structure, and from the, the profiles we flew and with the data analysis, uh, we knew the vector sum of the forces that were measured in all three axes clearly gave us a vector straight up, straight up and away when we would separate. So the really only concern was how was the flight control system stable because first time we're going to get a look at it is after we cut free. And uh, we of course had a backup system that was uh, degained to have more stability so we felt uh, if we could quickly switch to the backup and if we started losing control after separation, we could recover uh, that way. Uh, the vehicle itself was, uh, I mean, I, it, it, was, it flew better than in, in uh, handling qualities, what we call handling qualities, uh, as far as uh, piloting control aspects. It flew better than anything we had seen in any of our simulations. Uh, yes, I had flown gliders uh, mainly because I was uh, a tow pilot for the early uh, lifting body flights, the lightweight ones where we flew it up uh, using the, the C-47 uh, or DC-3 where we used it to tow the uh, lightweight uh, lifting body. And uh, it was ascertained that uh, if, uh, if you were uh, the guy towing the glider, you should know what it's like to be on the other end of the line. And so I did uh, a glider uh, training at Tehach in the Tehachapi Mountain area uh, to the uh, uh, west of uh, Edwards Air Force Base and uh, checked out in the uh, Schweitzer uh, 122 initially and I think it was the 126, a solo uh, single seat glider that uh, I later flew a number of flights in. It was kind of, kind of fun, I'd never been in a glider uh, and the quietness, not having an engine, uh, in fact, sometimes uh, coming into landing, they would, they would went right by a schoolyard and children would be out at recess and you could hear the children uh, screeching as they were uh, playing. Uh, we also, sometimes with uh, Don Malik, another, another pilot who was going to be a tow pilot, in training at the same time, we would uh, get into a good uh, standing wave where you got lots of lift and we would dogfight uh, with uh, these 126s. And there you could actually hear the metal crinkling and the wings as you were pulling G's. So that was a new experience as, uh, as well. Uh, yes, we had uh, a moving base simulator uh, at, uh, uh, at Johnson Space Center with a, uh, a wall, a vertical wall that would hit a map of the uh, very accurate map of the Rogers Lake bed and surrounding area <coughs> that uh, as you flew along it gave you that uh, view uh, to, uh, to do the approach and landing test. And it, of course, like a system trainer, could, could uh, emulate failures. So it's similar to our later system trainers, uh, at least credible failures in most of the systems uh, to get you uh, fine-tuned uh, that way. We also had a very uh, uh, good uh, trainer in the shuttle training aircraft. It was a Gulfstream aircraft that uh, the left seat was configured exactly like the cockpit of Enterprise with the same hand controller and the same instrument panel. And the safety pilot with a conventional Gulfstream uh, setup was in the right seat and could take over at any time uh, from the simulation. But when you went into the simulation mode, you were really flying through a computer that could emulate uh, by uh, moving the servos independent of your movements to handle like the shuttle should handle, uh, handling mollies wise. And it also by using the reverse thrust could create the drag, that, the same drag of effect of a shuttle to give you the steepness of the glide uh, to a landing. And the light came on when you were essentially at the landing gear point 
us to light to tell you you're affected a, a touchdown. And we could fly, obviously, uh, lots of fuel. We could fly many of these uh, approaches. Most of them we flew out at uh, White Sands, New Mexico, operated out of uh, El Paso, Texas, and flew approaches to a runway out at uh, White Sands. Uh, later, we did fly a few profiles uh, where we were really going to land out at Edwards Air Force Base on Rogers Lake Bay. Uh, actually, I was assigned to fly uh, the third auto mission. Uh, Jack Lousman and I uh, were assigned uh, to rescue Skylab. It was a very interesting mission. Uh, we got involved with the development of a uh, kick stage, if you will, a little booster that was going to be put in the payload bay. Uh, this was being developed uh, by Martin uh, in Colorado at their plant. And Jack actually was going to uh, operate this thing where we would release it from the payload bay and Jack would remotely fly it over to dock with uh, Skylab. And then uh, people on the ground would orient Skylab to either boost it or deorbit it uh, properly uh, into the ocean. Of course, uh, what happened uh, was the uh, sunspot activity uh, got stronger which, believe it or not, balloons our atmosphere enough to put a few more molecules at the altitude Skylab was at, create more drag, and then re-entered early. At the same time, we were having trouble uh, with the shuttle uh, tile system, and the shuttle schedule, uh, launch schedules kept slipping to the right. Briefly, we moved up from flight three to two, uh, in fact, to, uh, to be enable this uh, mission to happen. And then, effectively, Skylab uh, came in uh, in a semi-controlled way, and uh, the mission went away. Uh, at that time, what the, the, uh, pl the flight plan uh, for that flight changed then to what I'll call a uh, thermal test mission, where basically you uh, set around in Earth orbit and at various attitudes uh, to, to collect uh, data from thermocouples uh, to verify the analytical uh, thermal uh, studies that had been done. We really never did, a, unlike Apollo, we never did a thermal vacuum test for the shuttle vehicle, except for the payload bay doors, one of them, and one ohm spot. So the, the thought was to uh, extrapolate analytically and then uh, proof, do the proof while on orbit. And so that ended up being the primary mission. I think there were some secondary uh, tests with the manipulator arm that was done on that flight. At any rate, the, uh, when, the, when the rescue mission went away, uh, which I thought was a very exciting uh, mission to do, including a rendezvous, et cetera, uh, I decided that, uh, that it was time to really uh, start my uh, second career uh, in aerospace. And so I ended up resigning from NASA in 1979 to start that uh, next career. Uh, I have to say, I, I do not accept uh, for what I, I get in the media. Uh, I have uh, had a couple of sessions earlier with some, uh, some of the people working Constellation, particularly those with the uh, lander, uh, the planned uh, lunar lander, with uh, some of the thoughts of requirements and things that might be different uh, with the vehicle they might, uh, they might consider uh, for that mission. Of course, Constellation went away. Uh, other than that, I've, uh, I've followed it only, again, in what I've uh, read in uh, articles uh, and uh, in what I've seen in, in the media on uh, TV, for instance. Well, exclu excluding my NASA career, I would say the follow-on career ahead with the Grumman then Northrop Grumman. I, uh, I worked uh, four years for Grumman uh, heading space programs. Under that, uh, for instance, uh, uh, under me was building the wings for the shuttle, for the space shuttle. Uh, where I joined Grumman, they had built the first two sets, uh, but I was involved in building the remaining uh, sets for the later uh, space shuttles. A lot of the, the workstation tools uh, thing that's on the end of, end of the manipulator arm you see astronauts standing on 
and a lot of the special tools that we used in space uh, uh, we built. But the real achievement was uh, following that four years, uh, I was asked to start a subsidiary company for Grumman in service business, which I did incorporate in, into in Florida and set up uh, this business initially with the help of the corporation, uh, putting all the tech reps worldwide under me to give me sales space, if you will. And uh, from there, it competed uh, to grow the business. Uh, the very first contract, uh, major contract uh, we won was the shuttle processing contract. Uh, we were a teammate of Lockheed along with Thicol and uh, did that uh, job as kind of the centerfold of uh, the new company for 12 years, but continually growing to other contracts, uh, mostly uh, with the Defense Department, uh, but a few other uh, contracts uh, with NASA, for example. Uh, major contract at Johnson was uh, to take care of all the uh, computing equipment at Johnson and all the networks. In fact, everything computing-wise at Johnson except for mission control. Uh, that was not a part of that uh, contract. But it was a very diverse uh, set of uh, business that, that I, I enjoyed being a part of. At one extreme, we had PhD uh, scientists uh, working for the University of California at Los Alamos involved in uh, the uh, uh, design and the nurturing of nuclear weapons uh, down to uh, base support type contracts uh, at Huntsville for Redstone, where we supplied power, in fact, to Marshall Space Flight Center uh, with the Army uh, at Fort Eustis, Fort Monroe, and Fort Story, uh, uh, doing uh, motor pools, uh, warehousing, uh, doing even had to cooks at the, the three bases and the mess halls. So it's quite a, quite a diverse business that was uh, very widespread uh, across the country and with the tech rep business, even some overseas. Uh, what do I miss most about the pro power program was just the uh, excitement uh, and enthusiasm that drove you to work extremely, and, and it's just not me, and astronauts, but most of the people directly involved with the uh, flight operations and pre preparation to work extremely long hours. And uh, invariably in the early uh, assignments I had on Apollo 8 and Apollo 11, and even 13, the last uh, two months of that training always ended up virtually being seven days a week uh, in long, pretty long hours, eight uh, with some meetings going to 10 at night. So it was that kind of a uh, drive <coughs> to get the job done and, and stay within the timeline. Uh, well, one uh, funny story that also tells the, uh, the situation NASA was in at the time we were getting ready to fly Enterprise, the first time we were going to release it. You have to appreciate there's a problem that NASA has faced with major programs, with the exception of Apollo, which had pretty much full backing all through, uh, certainly up to, through the uh, Apollo 17. Uh, later, later programs, uh, be it uh, Space Shuttle, uh, which started uh, under uh, uh, under President Nixon, and uh, at the time uh, we got ready to fly Enterprise, the new administration had come in under President Carter, and it wasn't obvious that uh, high, very high on his priority list was uh, was NASA and NASA programs, and uh, the, the nervousness I think was expressed by our ground crew <coughs> when Gordon Fullerton and I uh, climbed aboard that morning to go fly, <clears throat> fly that flight, when uh, right beside the ladder as we got ready to climb up to the upper deck were two Polaroid pictures. Uh, these pictures were of two figures in blue flight suits like we were wearing at that time. And they had their helmet on and they had uh, visors down and an oxygen mask sort of dangling so you couldn't really tell who these people were. They're sitting on huge floor sweepers in a hangar. And the sign there said, if you follow this up, this is your next job. So I think the ground crew was pretty worried about if we crashed Enterprise. There was no backup uh, because of cost constraints 
we had canceled one vehicle that was to be a backup for Enterprise. We originally were going to have two test vehicles for that program. So there was no backup and it was, we'd obviously lost several years uh, to get back in line had we uh, crashed or dam seriously damaged Enterprise. So that was a big concern, how, the, how it would be reflected with the new administration and possibly in the program uh, right there had we not uh, been successful. Uh, I've not really planned uh, an autobiography, at least not a published uh, version. I've created some uh, text at this point. It's more, frankly more family background. We did, my family uh, did not have a, like traditionally in those days, a, a large Bible where a lot of notes were kept uh, either in front or back of the Bible about family matters. Uh, so there was no documentation. And I've uh, tried to uh, not just document facts uh, like births, etc., but also to uh, talk about the character of the, at least people I knew. Uh, very interestingly, my uh, granddad Hayes, uh, he lived to be 99 and a half years. And it's always been amazing to me to think about talking to him about the early days in Biloxi, but it really only had one paved street out of brick and the rest of the roads were uh, dirt or crushed oyster shell, and they, he had two carriages, one a uh, Surrey and one, a, one with the closed doors and closed up, and lanterns even to light when they went out at the road at night, and how they used to just tie up the horses on Main Street uh, to a post on uh, Howard Avenue. But even earlier, in his youth, the fam his family lived in Springfield, Illinois, and when he was in the fourth or fifth grade, he had to rem uh, memorize a poem, which incidentally he could recite for me when he was 90, about 95 years old, and I did not record it. I'm saying to this day, I did not. But the reason that he had to memorize that poem was his class had been asked, was one asked, to go out for the final interment of Abraham Lincoln. When Abraham Lincoln uh, was assassinated, uh, he went across the country on the train, I guess, and made stops at various places uh, for people in mourning. But his final burial was in Springfield, Illinois. And it's just amazing to me to think my granddad was at that uh, final uh, burial ceremony as a part of it. Uh, it's such, such a short, seems like so long ago, but yet not so long ago.